Children's Day here on the 4th of July. Kids are going to be taking the service, singing some songs, reading verses of scripture, and uh, just really looking after the whole morning service for us, and we look forward to that. So we're going to stand. Come on, let's stand and sing Beautiful Savior, followed by I Stand Amazed. Abby's just ready to get the second or, or, or opening hymn. I stand amazed, ready for us to sing, and we're all preparing to give our offering to the Lord. Happy Father's Day to all the wonderful men out there, all the wonderful fathers. God bless you. I'm sure you've all been spoiled, Robin. <laughs> nobody, nobody picked that up. David Dunlop has just walked in here with a new shirt on this morning, I'm telling you. It's like some, something out of Hawaii 5 He looks absolutely brilliant. So there you are. So 
<laughs> Happy Father's Day. And we're ready to sing. Great to have Abby looking after things. Gloria's away for the weekend with George. And uh, God bless them. I'm sure they're listening on this morning to the broadcast from the Bayview in Port Ballantrae. So there you go. That's how the other half lives in the welcome. So, Abby, thanks very much. Can we sing I Stand Amazed in the Presence? Come on, let's sing it out. <laughs> there we go. Glory. Thanks, Lindsay. Thank you. So we're just going to come before the Lord in prayer. Just going to pray for the Lord's blessing upon our service this morning. It's great to see so many kids here, isn't it? Looking, and I want to encourage us to come along in a couple of weeks to the Children's Day and really support them um, because it's great to see them week after week coming along to church and being a part of our church family. And so. We're just really looking forward to letting them loose and, uh, and just seeing what happens on that morning, the 4th of July. And we continue to pray for bereaved families 
um, thinking of the Harkness family circle in the area that God will really comfort them at this time of bereavement. And for other families that are going through bereavement, that God would really help them at this time. And for all who are sick, all who are needy, um, we continue to pray that God would really help. Thinking of um, a relation of Kate and Andrew, we're just praying uh, that God will really step in there. And other needs that we've been hearing about in recent times that, that God will really just touch and minister to those that are sick. So let's come before the Lord right now in prayer. Let's just pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning that we can draw near to a living God. And as we just lift our voice to you in prayer, Lord, I thank you for every head that is bowed here in your presence. I thank you for every child and every leader that has just left to go across the way, the kids reach. And Lord, I pray your blessing upon each one. And even whatever they're organizing, whatever they're planning to do, Lord, will you bless all of their efforts in the name of the Lord Jesus. I also thank, Lord, of folks that are watching online this morning. And I really pray, Lord, that you would minister to those that are sick, that are needy, those that are going through issues, problems, whatever it may be. Lord, those that have taken the time to watch on, would you really just minister to them and meet them at the point of need? I think of the Harkness family. And I pray, Lord, that you'll comfort them as only you can at this time. Think of other families that are going through bereavement. Even here today on Father's Day, Lord, I really just pray that as hearts are tender, Lord God, that you would really minister to those, Lord, that need your help. And I pray, Lord, you're blessed upon our service this morning, um, especially as we open up God's word, that your word will come alive, that your voice will speak in the hearts, because we know that you have something to say to us today from your word. So, Lord, would you bless our time together? Would you hear us? Would you answer our prayers? And we will be careful to give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let me give you some announcements before we just turn to God's word. Tonight at 6.30... It's the last night, isn't it, of the Christianity Explored? And what a great success that has been. I mean, everybody that we've been talking to, they don't want at the end. of these have really enjoyed it. Uh, and, you know, and, and, and I've been hearing how that even afterwards people have been staying behind and having extended conversations. I know what that's all about. You just don't want to go back to the house too quick. <laughs> but, um, but that's good. <laughs> but it's good that you're coming together and discussing things, the subjects that you've been learning it's a whole purpose of this. And, uh, and so we're delighted how well that that has went. And, um, and so tonight's the final night. Mark has said to me, look, can you not call down? And I said, look, I'd love to call down. But look, I have to bring a furry friend with me as well. So yes, I'll get a wee surprise tonight, accompanied by a five-month-old golden Labrador um, coming in. I know some of you would like the same. So I think this is a good opportunity. And maybe this will be the time where you'll think, I'll just stay away then, I'll not come. Um, but anyway, so I really pray that you will have a good night tonight um, uh, with the Christianity Explored. And uh, we, the good news is that there's another couple of um, courses that are really a follow-up to Christianity Explored. There's a Hope Explored, there's a Discipleship Explored. And having had a chat with Mark, I know that, and I hope I'm not revealing things too quick here, um, but talking about starting our next one, hopefully maybe in around September time. Um, get, let us get over the summer, start it again in September. And so I know that the folks will really enjoy that. And so, yep, so it's a pity that tonight's the last night, but it will continue. We will be looking at, at bringing in different courses to help the folks um, who are really interested um, in studying God's Word together. So that's tonight. Uh, Tuesday night is our Bible study, and we're looking forward again to opening up God's Word. Um, this week, it'll be our third week in the, the letter of Jude. There's only 25 verses. Uh, we have looked at assurance and days of apostasy uh, the first two weeks. Uh, this week, we're going to look at present day apostates, what that is all about. And so let's bring our Bibles 
Uh, and let's study God's word together and see what he wants to say to us. Tuesday night at 7.30. Again, I'm encouraging folks. Um, look, please come out. I know some folks are watching some online. I know some folks also um, have work commitments and different things um, that are going on, family commitments. But if you can make it here on Tuesday night, it's great to see an increase last Tuesday. We would love to see the church filling up more, just more people coming with that desire to study God's word and to pray and to have a time of communion. So that's Tuesday night at 7.30. Next weekend, um, 11.30, our morning broadcast here in the church. Uh, we won't be here next Sunday because um, it's a wee while since we have made our annual visit to the Democratic Republic of Geordieland, commonly known as Newcastle-upon-Tyne. Um, so we're just going over there to see a few friends. There's no football on. We'll just go and spend some time with our friends sit for a few hours and study the Tyne Bridge or something like that or whatever. Um, but we're just looking forward to getting a little bit of a break away just for a few days. Um, back in again on Monday. We'll be back, back on Sunday afternoon uh, and then back in here again on Sunday morning. Or Monday morning, sorry. Uh, Mark Armstrong, who's, taken the, the, who's been taking the week's Christianity Explored. Mark will be ministering next, Monday, next Sunday morning to you um, at 11.30. I know that Mark's no stranger to the church and I know that you'll enjoy him as he comes to minister to you. So that's next Sunday morning. Uh, Mark will be looking after the meeting. Gary will be leading. And we'll be thinking about you and praying for God's blessing upon our time together. So I think that's all of the announcements um, out of the way. So we're going to turn in our Bibles, please. If you've brought a Bible with you, or if you're just following um, but the words on the screen, or... If you've got an electronic device, a phone or a, an iPad, whatever you're using, I want you to turn with us this morning to Nehemiah chapter 8. And we're going to read from verses 13 down to the end of the chapter. It's really a continuation from where we left off last Sunday. And so as we look at verse 13 of Nehemiah chapter 8, God's word says this. Now on the second day, the heads of the fathers' houses of all the people with the priests and Levites were gathered to Ezra the scribe in order to understand the words of the law. And they found written in the law, which the Lord had commanded by Moses, that the children of Israel should dwell in booths. Booths is another word for temporary shelter or a tent. They should dwell in booths during the, the feast of the seventh month. And that they should announce and proclaim in all their cities and in Jerusalem, saying, Go out to the mountain and bring olive branches, branches of olive trees, myrtle branches, palm branches, and branches of leafy trees, to make booths as it is written. Then the people went out and they brought them and made them, they made themselves booths, each one on the roof of their house or in their courtyards or, and, or the courts of the house of God. And in the open square of the water gate and in the open square of the gate of Ephraim. So the whole assembly of those who had returned from the captivity made booths and sat under the booths, for since the days of Joshua, the son of Nun, until the day the children of Israel had not done so. And notice this, and there was very great gladness. It's lovely to see people with smiles on their faces, isn't it? An occasion like this, coming together, so happy, so glad. And then he finishes off, also day by day, from the first day until the last day, he read from the book of the law of God. And they kept the feast seven days, and on the eighth day there was a sacred assembly according to the prescribed manner. And we'll just stop there and pray that God will bless his word to our hearts this morning. So we want to talk about the reinstitution of a sacred feast. And as we continue on from the verses that we we left off at verse 12 last week, 
and as we have read from 13 down to verse 18. And really this is a a follow-on from the revival blessings from the previous day. Do you remember last week we talked about the Watergate Bible Conference? Over 50,000 people gathered in one place. They hungered to hear the word of God. We talked about how that they repented of their sin. And then what followed was a conviction, led to a cleansing, and then came the celebration. And we saw all of that. In fact, verse 12 says these words, And all the people went their way to eat and drink, to send portions and to rejoice greatly because they understood the words that were declared to them. Dr. David Jeremiah, who we've been using throughout this study, his study Bible has been a great help, um, just referring to it, just looking at it. He actually said regarding this verse that there were four results from the reading and the understanding of God's word. The people worshipped, that was the first result. They mourned their sin, that was the second result. They obeyed the instruction to celebrate, and then they rejoiced by feasting and also by sharing. They didn't keep it all to themselves, they shared with others. Once people hear God's heart, then a response will naturally follow. And that is so true. I remember a preacher once saying regarding the Bible, and I've never forgot this over the years. He said that Christians, concerning the Bible, they should pick it up. They should let it in, what they're reading, and live it out. Pick it up, let it in, and live it out in your daily walk with the Lord. And from the verses that we have read today, we see very clearly that hearing the word had led the action, both individually and as a nation. Again, I'm encouraging you folks, when we read God's word, it's not a matter of just picking it up and just, yeah, reading this. And sometimes it could end up just a habit. I don't believe that God wants us just to read it, you know, if it's just a habit or, you know, where we become very legalistic in our mind as if some kind of a natural disaster is going to happen to us if we don't read it at a certain time. I don't mean it like that. I mean, we should read God's word every day, but we should read it with the point of letting God's word really speak into our hearts to say, well, what do you want to say to us today? There's a way of reading God's word. And these people who listened to God's word, it really led the action. It really did. On this occasion, the Israelites realized it was like, whoever has those light bulb moments that just flash off? Nobody? These are all so educated around here. I'm just talking to myself. Okay. But it was like a light bulb moment that just went off in the hearts of all of those people. They realized that since the days of Joshua, which wasn't yesterday, from this passage to when Joshua was about, he was the successor of Moses, if you remember. They realized that from his day, when under his leadership they crossed over into the promised land, they'd realized that they had neglected one of the Jewish celebrations that they were commanded by God to observe. And this feast was called the Feast of Tabernacles. I don't know if any of these have really studied that much about the Feast of Tabernacles, but I'm going to explain it to you just in a moment. We're actually told about this feast. Here's a good starting point for the Bible student. Leviticus chapter 23, verses 33 to verse 36. This is what it says about the Feast of Tabernacles. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, The fifteenth day of the seventh month shall be the Feast of Tabernacles for seven days to the Lord. On the first day there shall be a holy convocation or gathering. You shall do no customary work on it. It was a day off. 
For seven days you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. On the eighth day you shall have a holy convocation. And you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. It is a sacred assembly. And you shall do no customary work on it. Let me follow on to what we're told about the sacred feast in Deuteronomy. Chapter 16, verses 13 to 17. We are told, You shall observe the feast of tabernacles seven days. When you have gathered from your threshing floor and your wine press, and you shall rejoice in your feast, you and your son and your daughter, your male servant, your female servant, and the Levite, the stranger, the fatherless, the widow, who are within your gates. Seven days you will keep a sacred feast to the Lord your God in the place which, he, which the Lord chooses because the Lord your God will bless you in all your produce and in all the work of your hands so that you shall surely rejoice. Three times a year, notice this little add-on from Leviticus, three times a year all your meals shall appear before the Lord your God in the place which he chooses, at the Feast of Unleavened Bread, at the Feast of Weeks, and at the Feast of Tabernacles. And they shall not appear before the Lord empty-handed. Every man shall give as he is able, according to the blessing of the Lord your God, which he has given you. Two passages that really explains the whole setup of what the Feast of Tabernacles was about. And as a result of obedience to what the Israelites here in Nehemiah chapter 8, what they had heard from Ezra the scribe, what they had found written in the law concerning the feast of tabernacles. Then the Israelites immediately, once that light bulb moment went off, they got to work in reinstituting this sacred feast. Verses 16 and 17 that we've just read tells us again, then the people went out, and they brought them and made themselves booths, tents, temporary shelters, each one on the roof of his house. Remember houses back then, they were built with those flat roofs where there was plenty of space, and, or in the courtyards or the courts of the house of God, and also in the open square of the water gate and in the open square of the gate of Ephraim. So the whole assembly of those who had returned from the captivity they made booths, sat under their booths. Notice, for since the days of Joshua, the son of Nun, until that day the children of Israel had not done so. And there was very great gladness. Now as you listen on this morning, maybe some of you are thinking, well, you know, this is a great history lesson from the Old Testament. We're learning something about a feast that the Israelites observed. So, what is the importance of all of this? What was the importance of this feast? Well, there was three things attached to the importance. It was really a time for the Israelites to look back. Good time for them to look back and to remember the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. Remember the story how that Moses with the Exodus, Pharaoh, coming before Pharaoh, let my people go. And then they went on a journey for 40 years where they didn't have a permanent home. They walked about for 40 years in circles, round in circles, but like myself when I'm driving around Belfast or the country. And, you know, they walked about and they wore the same shoes and the same clothes for 40 years, over 2 million of them. And, you know... God supplied them with food, manna from heaven, fed them, looked after them. What a story. And all these years later, this feast was a memorial. It was a time. Look back. Look back to what God did. Look back to how God brought the children of Israel on that journey. And yes, there was times they were disobedient. There was times the Israelites, they wanted to go back to Egypt. They complained. They murmured. There's no complainers or murmurers in here, is there? 
Okay, so we're in good company. Um, so, but you know, and Moses just, you know, if there had been earmuffs, you know, he would have loved you. Just, you know, I'm sick listening to this. You know, they're complaining. Oh, the food back in Egypt is better. The cucumbers, you know, all of the beautiful foods that are there. And yet they remembered that their time in Egypt was a time of slavery. Who would ever want to go back to slavery? And that's the mentality of those people. And as they journeyed, as they walked around for 40 years, it was a time when how that God parted the Red Sea, opened up a way where they crossed over into the promised land, the land of Israel. Yeah, it was a time for them to look back and to remember God's goodness and God's faithfulness. You know, it's good, folks, for us. I know that, you know, when it comes to this particular feast, that may not, you know, we're not Jewish people, we're not celebrating it. But you know what? It's a good thing for us to look back and to see God's goodness and to see God's faithfulness. Why don't you pause and think about that? Think about what God has brought you through through all of these years and give him praise and give him thanks. Have your own little feast in your heart and worship him and say, Lord, thank you for your goodness. Let us rejoice greatly at the goodness of the Lord. So it was a time for them to look back. It was also a time this feast was set up for a time for them to, to look around at the present, to have a look around them, at their harvest blessings from the hand of God. An appropriate song to sing at this feast would be, all good gifts around us are sent from heaven above. So thank the Lord. Yes, thank the Lord for all his love. They were never to forget as they looked around and they saw their produce and as they saw their food, they were not to forget their giver as they enjoyed their gifts and as they received from their hands. Folks, it's a good thing to look around today and to thank God for his goodness. Any of us that have left our homes today and wherever we go to today, afterwards, spending the day, thank God for food, thank God for our clothes, thank God for our shelters, thank God for our homes. You know, thank God for all of the good things that God has blessed us with. Because as the Israelites looked around at all of their blessings, there was a time when they didn't have a permanent home. And they didn't have a selection of shoes or suits or clothes. You know, they wore what they had on them. So it's a good thing to look around, folks, at the goodness of the Lord. And here's another thing, and I love this. The Feast of Tabernacles was not only a time to look back, it wasn't only a time to look around, but it was also a great time to look ahead. And what I mean by that is, you know, coming into the New Testament, it's really anticipating the time when those, think of the church, think of the blood-washed band, think of those, the church that is raptured, how that they will celebrate one day the joy, you know, of being called to the married supper of the Lamb. It's a great thing to look ahead to, folks what God has prepared. I was actually just watching something before I came out this morning and I just rejoiced that, you know, as the man, the preacher was talking about the great seven years tribulation and I'm looking forward, you know, at a time later on in the year where we can study all of this, study Bible prophecy and we see how that the church is raptured and how that there's seven years of tribulation and during that period... The Antichrist is revealed, and at the end of that, the, ba the Battle of Armageddon. I'm really wetting your appetite already here, aren't I? But you know something that's good, uh, you know, to think that those seven years, the church is taken away. It's, we're not even a part of what's going on here on this earth. And at the end of it, there's the married supper of the Lamb. Can't get any better than this. And if you want references, folks, read Revelation chapter 19, verses 1 to 10. And you'll see it all there, impacted in God's word. It's powerful stuff. So this feast is all about looking back. It's all about looking around. And it's about looking ahead. And thank God today, folks, that we can look ahead. You know, beyond this world, beyond this life, we thank God that there's a heaven, there's a home, there's an eternity where we will spend it with the Lord. Whatever your view, whatever your thoughts are regarding Bible prophecy, that's what's ahead for the believer. It's going to be a great time when 
We're not going to be living in sinful bodies anymore. We're going to be glorified, made in his image. That's something to look forward to. Powerful stuff. And so this was a week, a week-long festival of joyful praise, thanksgiving, just focusing on the goodness of the Lord. And do you know something, folks, today? It's a great thought for us as believers, you know, as thinking that we're going to be a part of this for all eternity, thinking about heaven today, thinking about that there's coming a day where we will praise, where we will worship, where we will constantly be in the presence of the Lord. And, you know, just to be in his presence and to give him thanks for all of his goodness. Doesn't get any better than this. And this feast is also a time for sending food. I really like this. It wasn't just a time, you know, to look back and to look ahead and to look around. But it was also a time where... At this feast, people just didn't gorge food themselves. They didn't just have their own little stockpile and just put on pounds like myself. You know, it was a time where they actually thought about others, where they sent food, especially to people who were in need. And again, it's also important, folks, for us thinking about this reinstitution of a sacred feast, you know, to, to think of others at this time to think of others that are in need and the help where we can help. And so the Jews here in this passage, they found real joy in hearing the word of God. But now they felt or they found real joy in sharing the blessings of God. And that is what it means when it says here, and they kept the feast seven days. Keeping the feast was not all, not all just about hearing, but also sharing their blessings. It was part of the joy, reinstituting this sacred feast. Folks, let's share blessings with others. If I was to go around everybody here, everyone here today and ask the question, sure, tell me how you've been blessed this week. I'm sure the hands would go up. I'm sure we could keep the service going here for another hour. How that you have been blessed. How that you have received from the Lord. Maybe folks would want to talk about how God has spoken. Maybe somebody would say, I would like to share what God has said to me today from his word. I'd like to share what God has spoken into my heart this week from his word. And thank God today that it's a living word. And also folks today, we can also, you folks that use Facebook, you know, another way that we can be a blessing it only takes, what, a second to hit the share button on your phone. Click. Even this message that's being recorded this morning, you can share that with others. And many others could listen in and also receive a blessing from what they hear. And it only takes a second, the press of a thumb, bump, share. Share a blessing with others. Even as you watch, share practically, share financially, with someone in need, if God has provided you with the means to do so. That's what this feast was all about. So part of the joy of this feast wasn't about keep everything to yourself. Share it with others. And watch God bless you. Watch God bless you. I always remember the late uh, preacher, David Wilkerson, saying these words. And again, these words stuck in my mind. He was talking to a young pastor and a young, said to the young pastor, this pastor came to him for advice and he says, you know, can you help me in my ministry? He says, yeah. He says, see in your church. He says, you know, do good to those who can do nothing for you. Minister to those who can do nothing for you in return and watch God bless you. I never forgot that. And there are people out there that you know, that you can minister to them. And maybe sometimes in your mind you think, well, you know, maybe they'll, they'll, they'll return. Maybe they're not even in the situation to ever to be able to do that. But if you minister to people who can do nothing for you in return and don't be looking for anything in return, watch God bless you and watch God encourage you. Share with others. Notice through these verses that the desire 
of the people was actually met with an incredible positive attitude. There was no negativity in the reinstitution of this feast. It is reckoned that this feast had not been observed for over a thousand years. Could you imagine that? Over a thousand years has, been, has went by. A thousand years this sacred feast has lay neglected in Israel's history. And there's nobody questioning here when the idea is, you know, comes up, let's reinstitute this. Nobody's saying, why should we reinstate this again? I mean, we've done without this for so long. Why bother now? A thousand years has passed. Why do we need to do this? Why start again? If our fathers before us didn't bother about it, why should we? There wasn't that attitude. Not at all. In fact, when they heard the word read, there was nobody sitting around trying to explain ways how that they could avoid obeying God. How can I get out of this? I hear what the word's saying. Now, how can I get out of this? No, in fact, they got up and they obeyed. And I just want to say to you folks here today, you know, if God is speaking to us from his word, if God is challenging us, if God is convicting us like he did to these people back in, in Nehemiah chapter 8, listen, don't try to run away. And don't try to make excuses for not obeying what the Bible is saying to you. Because we can, you know, we're living in days where everyone's living fast-paced today, aren't they? Nobody really settles. We're, we live in a fast world. That's why we have fast cars that speed in 20 and 30 miles an hour. That's why we have road ramps in our streets for people who speed. We have fast cars. We have fast food. If you don't feel like cooking, hey, presto, we can go and get fast food at the drop of a hat. People used to queue in banks. Don't need to queue in banks no more. We've got fast cash. Just get your flexible friend, hole in the wall, whatever. Bingo. Nobody needs to hang about any longer. It's the kind of world we're living in. The world that we live in is a world of speed. And so it's easy even in a church setting for people to say, well, I just don't have the time to commit to this, to commit to that. I can't. God is speaking to me, but how am I going to fit this in? How am I going to do this? I can assure you there was nobody saying that back here in this passage. There was nobody trying to make an excuse. There was nobody trying to get away. They were saying, right, how can we obey God's voice? How can we do this? And so I'm encouraging you today, respond in positive faith right now. Notice also this, verse 18. I'm coming to a close. Verse 18 tells us, also, day by day, he read from the book of the law of God, and they kept the feast seven days. And on the eighth day, there was a sacred assembly, according to the prescribed manner. And we highlight this verse, verse 18, really to show the hunger, to show the desire that the people had to hear God's word. You know, this wasn't a one-day wonder. Revival service, 50,000 people gathering at the water gate. Wasn't a one-day wonder. These people wanted more. They had such an appetite to hear God's word being read and God's word preached. They wanted it so much they came back the following day and the next day, day after that, in fact, for eight days, they came back day after day after day just to hear the word of God being preached, to hear the word of God being read. When was the last time we ever saw something like this? I mentioned this last week, and I know in the UK I can't think of any service anywhere. I know Madison, we talked about it last week, maybe somewhere in India or in Africa. You could go to a country, you can jump on a plane, and you can fly to a destination where you will find people. You know, maybe in a remote village somewhere. Well, they'll not think twice of sitting through a service for half a day and they'll bring their lunch and their food with them. And there's nobody looking at the clock and there's nobody looking at the watch to see, wish you'd shut up and get on with it here. We want to get out. <laughs> no. 
And that goes against the grain, doesn't it? You know, in the time that we live, this con- the time-conscious world that we live in where everything has to be on the deadline, on the dot. Here's the thing, folks. I'm sorry to say this to you. God is not governed by this watch or that clock. In fact, God is not governed by a 24-hour clock. Doesn't the Bible tell us that the day of the Lord is a thousand years? And a thousand years is one day. I can assure you that the God isn't sitting in heaven looking, you know, well, it's quarter past 12 here, you know. He needs to be finished by half. Let's get it over. (laughs) John. Goes against the grain. Listen, I understand that there's chickens in the oven, there's roasts on. You still want to go back to Levitical priesthoods. I understand that. Burnt offerings. But it does go against the grain. When, you know, living in the time that we do, churches, preachers, you're expected to stay on schedule. And if you go over it, well, that's when the watches will check and Max will creak. I can look at that, you see. I can see all the heads that look around at that. <laughs> or some of you will diplomatically pull your phones out because you've got a clock on your phone. Got a call here. No, I'm just saying here, folks, when you look back to this, I'm joking in a sense, but when you look back here, people had such an appetite to hear God's word. Such a thirst, just such a hunger. And all I want to do this morning, you know, thinking about this, reinstitution of a sacred feast and trying to understand something about this feast of tabernacles and what it was about you know if we can all leave here with a desire just to spend that little bit more time reading God's word studying the word and asking God to speak into our hearts and to show us what it is that he wants to say to us and as we close our service today (coughs) I just want to say to you is that there is such a joy and there is an excitement that comes from obeying the Lord and nothing can beat the joy of obeying the word of God. And I want to close with a quote from Warren Wearsby. And this is what he says. From time to time in the history of the church, God's spirit has burdened people to pray, to search the scriptures, and also to confess their sins. And from these sincere spiritual exercises, he has seen fit to bring fresh fire and life to his people. It happened in Nehemiah's day, and it can happen again right now in our own lives. And I pray, as we think about and as we meditate upon the reinstitution of a sacred feast that happened way, way, you know, all of those years ago when it was set up. I pray today in our own lives that God will really just light that fuse, stir the heart, give us that desire, the hunger and the thirst after God's word and to be obedient to it, not just reading it, but obeying what God's word is saying. I pray that will be all of our experience. And we'll all leave here richer for it. Let's just pray. And so as every head is bowed and every eye is closed, and we've listened to the word of God preached today, I just want to take a moment Just to ask this congregation, are we living in obedience to God's word? Does God's word, does it govern our lives? You know, when I read God's word today, I think of salvation. I think of the reason why Jesus came into this world. And the reason why he came was to die a horrific death in order that our sins could be forgiven. And there's a verse in the Bible that reminds us that except a man or woman be born again, they cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. 
In fact, they won't see the kingdom of heaven. And that's why I'm giving you an opportunity. If you want to obey God's word, maybe you're sitting here today and you're not a Christian. You haven't come to that point. And you might say to me, well, Jonathan, I I hear what you say, but, you know, I'm a good person. I don't do anybody any harm. I try and live to the best that I can. I try to tick all the boxes. But you see, folks, again, God's word reminds us that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You see, there's always a fallen short. And no matter how good we might think or how, might, or how right we are, if we're not saved, if we are not born again, when it comes to heaven, we will be caught up short. And that's why as we sit and as we listen to God's word, I'm encouraging you now, in fact, I'm imploring you now to do what the Bible says, call on the name of the Lord. And let the Lord save you for time and eternity. If you want to be obedient to God's word, here's the starting point. Invite Jesus into your heart. Let him save you. Maybe you're a backslider, somebody that's drifted away. You once walked, but you've drifted. It's time for the prodigal to come home. And I'm calling the prodigal home today. Let's recommit your life again afresh to the Lord. Maybe there is a believer here this morning. Maybe we have neglected, just like the Israelites of old, they neglected this feast. Maybe we're neglecting. Maybe we're neglecting prayer. Maybe we're neglecting Bible reading. Maybe we're even neglecting fellowship and in church with other people, God's people. Again, I'm just challenging you today. You know, whatever God is speaking into your heart about, let him just light that fuse. Let him light the fire. Let him stir the heart. And don't make the excuse, well, I haven't got time or I can't do this. Make the time. Make the time. And watch God bless you. Come on, whatever it is that's going on in your heart, in your life, just bring it before the Lord right now. Just confess it. Whatever you may need. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, today, I pray that you will bring salvation to this house. Lord, let there be a conviction conviction in hearts from your word where people will not leave until they get right with God. Lord, save the lost. Restore the backslider. And revive your saints here today. Help us, Lord, to have a heart like the people way back in this passage that we have read. Yes, Lord, help us to look back and give you thanks for all that you've done. Help us to look around and to thank you for what you've given us and to share it with others. And Lord, help us today that we can just to look ahead, just to look ahead at what lies ahead for the Christian. And Lord, how that just stirs our hearts. Oh God, today we pray. Meet each one at the point of need. For Jesus' sake. Amen. There was a song that we were meant to sing earlier, but we're going to sing it now. We're not going to do the servant, King Lindsay, but can we sing Jesus' holy and anointed one? Got that? Yep. It's a lovely song that we've been singing on a Tuesday night, and I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet. You will catch on to it. It's a lovely tune, uh, and uh, you'll be blessed. So let's stand together and let's sing it just as we leave.
going to ask one of the wonderful fathers of the welcome <laughs> to close us in prayer. Gary, God bless you. Thanks, Gary. Our gracious God, our loving Father in heaven, Father, once again, we do thank you and praise you that we had the freedom to gather together this morning Amen. in thy place of worship. Amen. And Lord, we are here <coughs> to worship you. For you, Lord, are the ancient of days. You, Lord, are the Alpha and the Omega, the first, the last, the beginning and the end. And we thank you, Lord, that we can come before you in no merits of our own, but only in the merits of thy dear Son, who loved us and gave himself for us. Father, we thank you and praise you for your precious truth that was spoken today. We thank you, Lord, for the pastor. We thank you, Lord, and we ask you the blessing undertake for him. Amen. And we pray, Lord, that you would continually lead and guide him, that your word will be a lamp onto his feet and a light onto his paths. Part us, Lord, with thy blessing. And we will be careful, Lord, to give you all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor. In Jesus' precious name, amen. amen.